So yeah, I got some uh, good stories from the islands and yeah, I'm happy of uh, having uh, three of them uh, on board and uh, Kithnos and Astipale, they are two of the islands that we are working very uh, closely, but also Halki has uh, some very good examples, but of course all the other islands. So I think, yeah, we are, we are trying to spread the word of uh, good news and good solutions uh, across the world. Um, so yeah, we have the, the, the session that is uh, about to talk about the, the elephant in the room uh, that has been already mentioned a couple of or more times. Uh, grids, uh, interconnections, storage, and all these uh, new or not new uh, technologies that are there in place and we are all expecting them to be delivered as an enabling uh, technological framework for the realization of the so-called vision of the 100% renewable islands or the high penetration of renewables or decarbonization of energy systems. So, uh, very shortly, um, uh, well, for, for me it's a kind of a funny or special day because I kind of see my, my life going through the, the discussions. Um, uh, myself, I'm a mechanical engineer on renewables and more than 15 years ago I went to Denmark to study on uh, wind. Um, and uh, before doing so, I, I, I you know, explicitly decided to do uh, my, my thesis in the Technical University in Athens on uh, the high penetration of renewables in the island of Lesbos. It's uh, the island where my parents come from, on the northeast. And at that point, uh, 15 years ago, 2005, uh, you can count uh, the years. Uh, I may look old or young, I don't know. Uh, but at that time we were discussing about pumped uh, hydro, um, pumped storage, and batteries were not in the, um, in the discussion uh, as a solution for, for storage. And we were discussing about reaching 70% uh, of uh, penetration of renewables with uh, geothermal energy, with biomass, with uh, wind, solar, and uh, pump storage. Um, some years uh, after that, more or less five years, coming back from Denmark and standing on wind, um, I started collaborating then with uh, Daphne, and that was the time we were working also together with uh, Alexis back in time. And uh, we realized that uh, grids are uh, the main issue. So at that point, uh, more than yeah, 10 years now, uh, Daphne mobilized the project with the financing from the Commission and the European Investment Bank on smart grids and trying to mature technologies on the digitalization of grids in order to enable the higher penetration of renewables, especially in non-interconnected -inter islands. And that's, that's many years ago, and still we are discussing more or less about the same or similar issues. We're changing some technologies. We're including uh, more variables in the discussion, but still we're trying to, to reach uh, that. So the session is, uh, is about that uh, today. Uh, trying to, to reshuffle the cards and see what we have on our uh, plate uh, regarding uh, uh, the grids and the technologies. Uh, in many cases, uh, in different member states, we have, and I know that the Costa Paris will discuss about that, but we have you know, uh, black boxes or we have derogation schemes that they are not very uh, specific um, to the rest of the world or the other member states. So we'll have the chance to discuss about that and uh, also the study currently carried out by the Secretariat and going deeper into these issues. Um, there will be an effort of setting more light into that. So with this uh, short introduction, I would like to, to ask uh, the panelists to come in, in place. Uh, uh, Kostas, uh, Elisa, uh, Nuria, uh, Claire and uh, Terje. Ah. You have to help me with that. <laughs> uh, please uh, take your, your seats. Uh, what we will try to do, I mean, the, the time is, uh, is limited. Teria. Okay, there you are. So, yeah, the time is, uh, is limited and we have some presentations, we have some uh, interventions. Um, we'll use uh, five minutes per person to have some initial interventions in the first round and then uh, we'll have some reflections. Um, uh, Kostas Kiparisis and uh, Elisa, uh, at least they have a, a broader, let's say, um, uh, framework of discussion uh, and uh, you will understand what I, I mean. And uh, the rest of the speakers will go into more specific details either on geography or technology related. And we have the chance to make an open session for questions and answers for the last uh, 15 minutes. So, uh, we're starting with uh, uh, Elise. Um, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Elise van Dijk, I work at Think E, a Leuven-based SME helping companies and uh, public instances in their transition to clean energy. We are a partner in the clean energy uh, for EU Island Secretariat, who I'm going to be representing here today. 
uh, our role is to help out with the technical assistance as well as the studies that we'll be carrying out in the, this project. Today I'll be presenting uh, the results that we've done in a previous phase of the barriers and recommendations that EU islands face in their transition to clean energy, as well as introduce the new study that we will be carrying out in this phase. Thank you very much. This is on. Okay, so uh, to Kosovsky Parisis, uh, would you like to start with your uh, intervention and the short presentation you have prepared? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Kostas, for the introduction, and thanks also very much to the Secretariat for inviting Euroelectric um, in uh, this uh, year's forum also. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very good uh, discussion we have with uh, uh, the Secretariat, uh, and it uh, deepens the relation between um, the clean energy transition and uh, the industry of electricity uh, that uh, Euroelectric uh, represents. So for those who are not familiar with uh, Euroelectric, uh, it's uh, the largest European um, association on electricity. We represent um, 34 national associations uh, from 32 European countries, um, plus uh, a number of uh, business members overall. We have more than 1,000 utility experts. Uh, within this uh, Euroelectric structure, we have uh, various working groups. One is uh, the Network of Experts on Island Systems, uh, to which uh, I chair. Uh, this brings uh, experts from uh, various uh, countries who are uh, uh, mostly uh, focused on, on islands. And actually, it's, it's a very good coincidence that in the last months we have been discussing in this uh, network of experts on, on grids. So it's a very good match that we see uh, the Secretary is taking up uh, this uh, report on, 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 uh, on grids. So I would like to share with you some of these uh, discussions we have been having in our network. Um, touching on um, uh, some of the key points which uh, we consider are of relevance. And uh, we think that uh, the, the issue of grids uh, uh, goes through uh, all components of the electricity systems, mainly the regulatory, the technological, and the market uh, issues. So on um, the regulatory uh, level, we feel uh, that uh, grids uh, face to a, a great extent the consequences uh, from um, uh, systems uh, in some islands being uh, bundled and some being unbundled. Uh, bundled are cases like, for example, um, France, um, the Portuguese islands in the outermost regions, whereas in other uh, cases like uh, Greece, for example, uh, electricity systems have been unbundled. This has a, an important uh, consequence on, on development of uh, grids. Um, now, we, uh, there, are, there are various uh, ways to approach as to some feel that uh, regulation is too much, some feel that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's little. Uh, we have the opinion that uh, some things need to be uh, put in, in place in terms of uh, assisting the grid development. Because uh, currently, we see that uh, each country or each uh, set of islands, they, uh, they look into the grid development uh, by either relying on uh, complex derogations from uh, directives or by uh, national uh, schemes. And this is not always uh, the most efficient way to, to approach things because you're missing um, uh, knowledge and, uh, and some uh, synergies. Uh, a specific uh, issue which we consider is of uh, uh, greatest relevance and which I'll uh, uh, dive into uh, more detail for a couple of minutes uh, later on is the issue of stability. Um, now, uh, there are uh, stability tools that uh, uh, can um, uh, be developed to support uh, the clean energy transition. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the rest of the points to talk a bit more on this. On uh, the technological issues of the grids, we have the very well known of uh, saturation of grids, uh, the, the challenge. 
um, the fact that the grids now need to face bi-directional flows of energy, whereas traditionally they used to be uh, only through one direction. Now we have prosumers, we have dispersed generation, so this uh, bi-directional flow of energy causes uh, important technological challenges to the grids, as well as, of course, uh, the issue of the decreasing volumes of uh, synchronous uh, generation. Um, on uh, the market size, uh, of course, uh, we have it also in, in the morning that uh, there is a shortage of um, uh, technological providers in the islands and also of skilled uh, workforce. So that's uh, a major uh, issue. Uh, as well as uh, in the case of interconnected islands, the fact that uh, they are sometimes uh, asked to comply with uh, the same rules as in the mainland energy markets. And this is um, not a very um, fair. Um, uh, seasonality, of course, is, is, is a challenge for islands because uh, you have a specific volume of, um, uh, of clients uh, that uh, support uh, the, uh, the DSOs with the tariffs, whereas the actual consumers are much higher in um, seasonality. Now, uh, only a few words on uh, an issue which you consider is uh, of um, uh, high uh, critical uh, importance, and that's the issue of stability, uh, which evolves through the fact that uh, generation mix is uh, changing through uh, the introduction of uh, non-synchronous uh, generators. This is a nice uh, graph. I don't know if you can see it clearly. It's from the UK's National uh, Grid uh, ESO, which shows us uh, on, on the top the uh, types of um, uh, stability parameters which uh, uh, are produced by non-synchronous uh, generators such as wind turbines, uh, solar. So we see that in uh, short circuit level, we have less than one per unit. Uh, that's a way of measuring its uh, uh, delivery of such parameters. Whereas for uh, uh, dynamic voltage, again, less than a half of per unit. Whereas for synchronous generator, which was the traditional system with conventional power plants and hydropower, we have uh, multiple times uh, these uh, parameters plus the inertia, which is completely lacking from um, uh, the non-synchronous generators. Um, this means, uh, in, in practice, and for those who are not familiar with technical terms, that there is actually an issue of stability through this uh, change of uh, generation uh, mix. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, corresponds to the parameters of the inertia, of the electrical systems, of the short circuit level, and of the dynam dynamic voltage. Now, uh, what can, uh, can be done on this uh, missing uh, stability? One, we can bring this uh, missing uh, stability through interconnectors. That uh, has its, uh, its challenges and its limitations, because it doesn't mean that uh, the uh, parameters that we bring through the interconnectors are the right ones. That depends also on the uh, electricity uh, mix of the mainland, plus the fact that interconnectors are not always available. So you, you are on the good uh, track, but you don't uh, solve the full problem. The second one, which we believe uh, is the most coherent and uh, sustainable way is actually to provide these stability parameters through uh, synchronous components. But that needs uh, uh, planning, that needs to, to, to choose the right technologies so that you don't introduce any carbon emitting uh, sources in this. Um, but uh, we think this is the right way because uh, there is no uh, alternative at the moment, technical, uh, or to synchronous uh, uh, generator um, stability parameters. And of course, the last thing that one can do is do nothing. Um, this is unfortunately the case in, in several islands. Uh, you actually introduce uh, more and more uh, non-synchronous generator, and uh, you're just uh, expecting that you will be lucky and nothing happens. Unfortunately, things uh, sometimes go wrong, and this has happened even to the UK, which is a huge island. Uh, and they were left uh, without electricity uh, in, in the last years uh, due to the fact that they were lacking stability tools. So, um, in a nutshell, this is the, the main, let's say, message. Uh, we propose to, to dive uh, into the issue of stability in, in more detail, uh, also through uh, the regulation perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Gostas. <clears throat> so, Uh, that was. Uh, I was wondering about uh, this uh, second missing in the bullet points there, whether it was really on purpose, but it was on purpose. Uh, the stability can still be missing. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, not in five minutes, maybe seven minutes, but it was very good uh, uh, well, a summary of all the challenges uh, met by the, uh, the grid operators, and thank you, Costas, for that. Uh, indeed, uh, it, it becomes even more clear in non-interconnected islands, uh, issues of stability, they are even more provoked. 
and more intense. And I think uh, the study by uh, the Secretary Alice uh, will focus also on that eventually. Uh, I will give you the, uh, the floor again because uh, you made a short introduction of uh, yourself, but I think that uh, after the COSAS presentation, you can tell us about the work already carried out by the Secretary of study. Okay. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I can uh, now present the regulatory barriers. I'll wait for the presentation to come back up. It's there. It's there. Uh, already introduced the, the, the presentation. We uh, were in the previous phase of the study, we had a regulatory think tank. And in this think tank, we were focusing on the regulatory uh, framework uh, that happens on islands for clean energy. Uh, so I can do this now. Yes. Uh, where we would then identify legal, regulatory, and policy framework for clean energy on EU islands. And within this framework, we examined what the barriers were that uh, different member states experienced and what we can recommend to overcome those barriers. We focused on seven member states in this study. And I'll briefly take you through uh, the barriers that we summarized in our studies. All these studies are also available online on the Clean Energy for EU Islands website. So if you want more details, please feel free to, uh, to look on there. Um, the main barriers that we experienced were, uh, of course, today's topic for the panel, the grid constraints and the security of supply, which I'll delve in a bit deeper later. Uh, strategic and systematic planning, spatial planning community, uh, complex and ethically authorization procedures, as well as support uh, tailored to island needs. You may recognize some of these barriers already. I've heard them in passing in today's sessions, uh, particularly the community involvement, for example, that. Uh, it is essential to get uh, the community involved on the ground, um, not only in terms of convincing, but also in terms of awareness, have experts on the ground that are actually uh, active in energy on the islands, um, and raising awareness there, as well as um, the systematic planning and coordination. I've heard this one in passing as well today, that a lot of the long-term strategies and uh, national energy and climate plans really occur on the national level and on the central level, and might not always um, represent what specifically islands might need. So there's some room for improvements or at least considerations for the islands in those plans as well. So that's in brief, uh, the regulatory barriers. Uh, we have some recommendations per barrier as well in all the studies that we've done. Um, as you can see on the map on the right here, uh, the top three, oh. Yeah, there, there. <laughs> uh, the top three uh, barriers are summarized per country, and the grid constraints is one that comes up in most of the member states as the top three. In Spain, even the top two of the top three barriers. Um, grid constraints have to do with, uh, first of all, the capacity constraints on the grid. There is just simply isn't enough capacity to uh, invest in renewables, install renewables on the islands. Um, as, uh, additionally, long-term grid development plans by the DSO need to be set for a fixed number of years, sometimes six years, sometimes even 10. Those need to be approved by often by the regulators. So that means that any developments that come up within this period uh, don't actually come off the ground because certain investments in the grid need to be made which don't fit within the plan. And so uh, it takes longer for these uh, investments to take place, uh, as well as a lack of security of supplies of supply where uh, security of supply weighs, outweighs investments in renewables because uh, old technology, old um, generation installations as well as stringent legislation uh, means that a lot of reserves uh, are taken up for security of supply and security of supply had therefore as priority over using that capacity for uh, renewables. Um, and lastly, the legal framework uh, could also give, provide more room. We've heard that one as well a lot today, regulations, regulations. Um, so very stringent connection constraints uh, that might not actually match today's technology anymore. Uh, but also where there's a new legal framework, uh, it takes a while for that to meet today's uh, level of innovation. So uh, it's there, but it, it's a time factor. Um, so as a result, uh, we will be uh, carrying out a study in this phase of the project, uh, focusing a little bit more on this issue, on the grid constraints, by identifying connection policies and management of energy systems on non-interconnected islands, and specifically for non-synchronized generation, also high-res generation, 
Um, and we want to really collaborate with uh, island experts and provide policy recommendations. So we will be focusing more on, um, on these issues in the next phase of the study and dive in deeper into this barrier. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, I think that we are, we are already addressing uh, similar issues with uh, Euroelectric, and I'm sure that the Secretary uh, would uh, uh, love to work uh, closely with uh, Euroelectric um, in the near future. And we'll get more chance, uh, more time to discuss about the, the new study of the, of the Secretary uh, on, the, on the deep dives. Um, I would like to give the floor to Taria. Uh, and uh, well, I uh, would expect to hear, you know, well, barriers and challenges about the, uh, the wind energy development uh, business in, in Estonia. But I, I'm sure that you are also very familiar about the, the grid issues in, uh, in this uh, in this country. Yes. Hello, my name is Terja Tailva. I'm uh, CEO of Estonian Wind Power Association. So, and um, to explain why I'm sitting here in the grid panel and not the DSO, then uh, in Estonia. Uh, our uh, uh, domestic needs for, for for one year is about nine uh, terawatt hours, and one offshore wind park will be produced four terawatt hours. So we gonna need two or maybe three offshore wind parks in Estonia to to fulfill our needs for electricity. That is really really simple way to put it, but then you understand. And most of, not most, all our offshore wind park are um, planned to be west side of, on Estonia, to the sea, of course. Uh, but our uh, electricity production has historically been in the east side of Estonia, and not like the middle, <laughs> but east, east, next to the Russian border. So all the grid that is coming, uh, uh, that is cap capable to take in electricity is coming from east to the west. And now, in 2028, where there will be the first offshore wind park, all the electricity has to come from west and moves to the east. And um, there is a main green on the mainland, of course, electricity grid. There is connection to Saarema, the main grid. But for example, the next island for us is Hiuma, and Hiuma is not connected to the main grid. On, on Estonia. So it's a big big difference and we have to change our ways like really rapidly and really fast and make a lot of e uh, investments and uh, a lot of planning and the 2028 is our deadline over there, our goal. And I have to say that uh, uh, offshore wind park uh, project is so expensive that it's not possible that we have the wind generators and no grid to take this electricity in. So in that sense, it's not only about Saarema, it's, it's about Estonia altogether. Saarema happens to be the place when the new electricity is produced and Saarema is the new electricity hub or energy hub for all, for all Estonia. And the grid is the main first thing that we have to, uh, the first bottleneck for us. So if there is grid, there is life, there is electricity. Is there, if there is, uh, isn't any grid, then we can talk about, I don't know, hydrogen backbone or whatever, but the reality is that the grid is the first one and that's why I'm, I'm sitting here. And, and uh, what, is, uh, what is our bottlenecks in this process is time and money, of course. We have to do a lot of planning. We have to, uh, there is a lot of local people who has to be accepting the new grid and it's not going to be too easy, and it's like the big change. But that is the the, the situation that we are in in this uh, in this very moment. Okay, uh, well, that's uh, that's indeed uh, a special case in terms of uh, grid uh, constraints having uh, due to also strategic or you know uh, geopolitical factors to reorganize actually the the grid. And yeah, in fact, I'm familiar also with the structure of the grid that you have like 300, I think, kilovolt grid from the to the east, but then in Sarem it's only 110. <laughs> so you really need to to, to to you know to shift of the the table in terms of uh, grid, and um, yeah, uh, it means more like a historical rearrangement of the, of the grids for uh, for Estonia. But uh, I think also in in islands it can happen in many cases that you have. Islands big at the coastline, uh, and meaning that many cases can be away from urban centers that the production was uh, established, and then being at the edge, at the weak 
points of the of the grid. So I think that the example of Estonia can apply in many cases in other islands and coastal areas. Um, let me give the uh, the floor to Claire from uh, CPMR, and uh, we can hear some uh, projects developed by the members of CPMR and with innovative solutions and in in islands not so close to European mainland. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm uh, Claire Healy. I'm a project officer uh, at the CPMR Islands Commission. So first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much for this event and for this invitation. So today, um, next slide, please. Ah, it's me, sorry. <laughs> Not used to it. Yes. So uh, today I will focus on two projects, but first of all, uh, let me say a few words about the CPMR Islands Commission. So we are one of the six uh, geographical commissions of the CPMR, so the Conference of the Peripheral Maritime Regions. Uh, so we are a network of 19 EU regional authorities um, from five sea basins in, uh, in Europe and beyond, with a total population of around 15 million. Um, what we do is we advocate for a better recognition uh, in EU policies of the specific strengths and challenges met by islands. And we also foster interregional cooperation between islands through projects and best practices exchanges. So you can see we work on a, on a, a var variety sorry, of uh, topics um, of interest to our members, but of course we also work on energy which will be our topic today. So first of all, let me take you to another beautiful island, which is the island of La Réunion. So it's a French outermost region in the Indian Ocean, which has a tropical climate and an important potential for solar energy. Uh, it has, of course, an insular environment and also a non-interconnected grid. So as we mentioned before, uh, that induces a lot of uh, technical constraints, uh, such as a sensitivity to unexpected generation variations on the grid. Um, also, what is interesting about the island of La Réunion is that it's uh, quite uh, large. Uh, it's not a small island. It's quite populated, uh, and it's a closed uh, uh, energy system. So that's a good uh, case study as well. And what is also worth mentioning is that there is a regional strategy uh, fostering uh, solar energy and which aims to achieve 100% of uh, renewable energy in electricity generation by 2030. So quite ambitious, uh, but uh, we all are. Um, and so the stakeholders on the ground are also pretty much engaged in that effort. And notably, we work with a laboratory um, with international expertise on these questions the laboratory Piment. However, it is lacking visibility uh, due to its remoteness uh, to, towards mainland Europe. So that's what we are trying to address through Twin Solar. Um, so it's a Horizon Europe project funded by the European Commission. Uh, and we have a twinning approach. Uh, first, to, f to, to bridge the research gaps uh, I just mentioned, and the, the technological constraints. Okay, I will uh, speed up. Um, and so we work with, uh, with Fraunhofer ESE and with DTU uh, to, to bridge these uh, research gaps. We also build a partnership and we will re reinforce uh, capacities to increase their uh, participation in Horizon Europe on the long term. And finally, we aim at uh, sharing the best practices and uh, this experience towards all uh, the European islands which may face the same challenges. So that's our role as CPMR. Very quickly, uh, just a few words about another project we are involved in, uh, this time in Mayotte, so on the other side of uh, uh, Madagascar, it's also a French autonomous region. And in this Horizon 2020 project, uh, we have the objective of uh, decarbonizing the energy system in Mayotte and in other European islands. So we will implement large scale renewable uh, deployment, also uh, to develop solutions to increase the flexibility uh, of this energy. Um, also, we 
we uh, work to involve the local communities through energy communities. And uh, finally, we are leading a replicability study in six other islands so that it's not only focused in Mayotte, but also in the island of Gozo, Favignana, Madeira, San Bart, Grand Canaria, and the island of La Réunion. So that's it for me. Uh, I won't be any longer, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. That was very much on, on time. And uh, indeed, the interesting projects uh, with the participation of CPMR, and we'll have more time to, to discuss on the way. And I would like to give the floor to Nuria uh, from La Palma, from the Canary Islands. And uh, we know that you've been working on different uh, projects, and you have a lot of experience on uh, also citizen-based and uh, citizen-led uh, projects. And uh, we also know that uh, in many cases, uh, where it's barriers and challenges related with the system and the grid. So tell us your experience from that. Thank you. Yes, uh, just to put a bit of a context, I come from uh, La Palma Renovable, which is a citizen-led uh, project. Uh, well, it started as a citizen movement. Uh, some citizens that were a bit of uh, disappointed, angry. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what words more I, I could put uh, because nothing was being done in, in the energy transition. And when you see the data, it's quite scary. So the citizens uh, created a group and started working with the idea, not just saying uh, what is wrong with the politicians that were doing not enough or, or nothing, depending how you look, but we had to actually get involved and, and add to, to the solutions, understand the problems and, and add to it. So we started working with an uh, um, insular uh, council and all the 14 municipalities, La Palma is an island who has, it has uh, 80,000 inhabitants. And we have a grid that's uh, isolated and it will never be interconnected because it's quite far from the other islands in Canary Island. Um, we have peak consumption, it doesn't reach 40 megawatts. Uh, it's usually less than that, uh, 20 during nighttime. So it's, it's quite of a challenge, but still, you know, it's kind of middle size. Uh, it's it's a big challenge to solve, but still, it's not huge. Uh, so we are working. Um, I'm a physicist, and I really love thinking in in systems. And what an island uh, allows is to think in systems because the connections are kind of uh, it's complex system, but still close enough so you see the action and reaction, right, of everything you do. So we have been looking at all different parts of the system. We started working quite a lot in identifying um, emissions, where we're, we're coming from, and understanding really the system, uh, the energy system, which is connected to the water, the, the food system and everything. But um, understanding the system first. And then we started to, to try to see how to solve the problem, right? One part is, is savings, another part is uh, new generation of uh, renewable energy. In that part, one of the things that we did, we, we promoted an energy community, which is already working, and this year is planning to, to install several, or, well, the plan, we'll see, because we have a lot of barriers. We could do a whole talk about the barriers also, but I don't want to depress you, so <laughs> I just took the, the nice part. We, we plan to install uh, nine different um, uh, self-consumption, collective self-consumption PV installations all over the islands, which will be almost one megawatt distributed and buy nine, seven electric cars for car sharing and a lot of more plans that we're, we're planning to do. Um, that's really uh, a, a nice project that we are very happy to, to be pushing. Uh, but then we're also working with other parts, like understanding the social system, how, how we are um, as a society. And last year we did a study of uh, energy poverty and it was really, really, uh, I don't know, terrific, or uh, it, it was really bad uh, what we found out uh, because you still, we work with the people, but when you see the whole picture, it's it's really scary. I think it was almost 30% of the household said that they couldn't maintain their house at, at adequate, uh, in a right temperature when we live in Canary Islands. <laughs> uh, so, and we find uh, almost, I think it's 16% they couldn't pay their, their bills. Um, so it's so much work to do that, and, and everything is connected, right? Because the energy community can't solve that problem, uh, but then the energy community, the first PV installation that wanted to do, couldn't connect it because of the grids, you know. And that goes to this um, 
problem or this situation that uh, you mentioned before, and grids are key and really are key uh, for the transition that we, we have to do. And in all studies that we have asked for in, at the Secretariat, they are, were actually all oriented uh, at, at understanding and finding solutions for, for the grid. And uh, I guess we can talk about this later. Okay, uh, so uh, you heard different um, um, approach to interventions from uh, our, our panelists and uh, coming from different uh, levels of intervention and different roles. Um, I would like, uh, before giving, the, uh, giving you know, the voice to you also and having some questions from the audience, uh, I would like to ask a, a reflection from, from Costas uh, Kiparis, and uh, we know each other uh, for many years and uh, uh, I didn't reveal the fact that uh, myself I've been involved in the DSO in Greece for three years in the in the board of directors back in back in 2015-18, and we were together with Costas in in you electing the Island Systems Expert Group, and we've been discussing these issues uh, over and over and uh, finding ways to overcome. So there is this you know, push, and there is a lot of uh, effort and uh, resources and the energy from people of making the change, introducing more innovation in the in the systems, uh, pushing of having electrical space or even rearranging the, the grids. And definitely this comes as a, as a strong, um, well, even uh, emotional, I would say, or even a political uh, push towards the, the grid operators. Uh, how does, uh, how, how, do, how do, you, do, do you deal with that? How do you uh, see that uh, as, a, as a duty, let's say, from the side of the grid operators to reflect on that or even work together with, uh, with the project promoters? working yeah uh, grid operators are in a difficult position because uh, they uh, in between uh, market and uh, regulator uh, so from the one side they need to ensure the continuity of, uh, of the supply to the consumers but they are in, in they need to work in, in a financial environment so they can go uh, up to, to a, a certain extent so uh, my reflection to what you mentioned Costas is that uh, uh, number one priority is uh, uh, ensuring the security of supply. Uh, so um, I believe the DSOs need to put the rules uh, that uh, the transition needs to be done in a safe way. Uh, and then act as a facilitator. So in other words, to not uh, pose any uh, non-proportional barriers as to uh, the actions by the, the local stakeholders as well as of the private sector. So from the one side, ensure the, uh, the technical uh, security of supply and then uh, facilitate uh, uh, the, um, uh, the solutions, which I believe uh, shouldn't come from the DSO, but it should be taken from the DSO and uh, be facilitated. And just a, a short follow-up uh, regarding the, well, also the, you have a, a title for our uh, event with uh, storage and flexibility. Uh, so this kind of you know novelties, let's say, although they are around, uh, and we've been discussing as uh, grid operators for several years, uh, is it something that um, you feel that can actually can relieve uh, the grid operators? They are. That it is something that it is well received, and there is an expectation from the grid operators to introduce them more um, intensively in their in the grids. Uh, it's not, in, in general, uh, I think adequately received, even though there are cases like uh, very bright examples where uh, local uh, uh, stakeholders have understood the importance of storage. And I believe what was, was mentioned by Terry on uh, the wind uh, and uh, uh, the discrepancy between the west and the west, I think that's uh, an issue which can be uh, heavily supported by uh, dispersed uh, storage, actually. Uh, it's uh, a service that uh, storage, which is the deferral of the grid's uh, upgrade, uh, which is very powerful. So uh, this is also, I think, a discussion in Germany, like wind is uh, on the north and uh, there is not enough grids to, to transfer the, the energy. So I think dispersed storage, storage is, is a, a very powerful tool that can be used. And I think, actually, it, it applies also to, to what you mentioned on the Canary Islands, because storage is not only huge installations uh, uh, that are done by the DSOs. It can also be residential or uh, commercial and industrial uh, storage. So um, you can uh, integrate uh, the dispersed storage to the prosumers and have a more, uh, um, let's say, uh, inclusive system. 
Okay, thank you, Costas. Um, Elise, um, well, I, I think that uh, the work that we're we're expected to do under the, the Secretary and going uh, deeper into the uh, study and on the Northern Connected Islands, it's it's quite linked with uh, the discussion we're doing also with the uh, Costas and the rest of the uh, the participants in the panel. Uh, can you give us some more details on that? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, my apologies. Uh, yes, we will be doing, so I briefly introduced the study in my last slide uh, at the end of my presentation before. Uh, we want to do a study where we really focus on the energy systems and the connection systems on uh, non-interconnected islands. Um, and our idea is uh, uh, also, for example, the examples that Claire and Nouria mentioned, where there is high-res or good projects that are being executed to really uh, go in deeper onto those islands and see what the success factors are, but also what the key challenges are that they are facing. Um, and to work together with those, uh, we'll be selecting 10 non-interconnected islands uh, with a different geographical spread, different member states' uh, governance, so that we have a very um, diverse uh, number of islands and to speak to the stakeholders on the ground, also bring in experts, uh, give trainings and workshops, to really work together um, and have a more practical approach to the issues that we uh, that they say that they face, uh, but also use the success factors as a good example for other islands uh, to show where it uh, what works and what doesn't work, and have some uh, representative examples that we can share also uh, through the secretariat. Okay, um, well. Uh, I would like to, to, to add to that that uh, what we see, and I think also from the Commission side, uh, starting to work with the island and geographical islands, uh, it is that especially when you go into smaller islands, which is also, let's say, potentially easier to, to go into 100% renewables or having a faster transition, uh, is that we are actually testing uh, uh, microgrids. Uh, the small islands, especially the non connected ones, they are considered microgrids, and there is a, you know, a, again, a you know, long-lasting discussion about even the transformation of the distribution system and whether we are going into from you know large production centers or big uh, wind farms, offshore wind farms, we can actually, you know, replicate or substitute big uh, thermal power plants into more distributed energy sources and energy systems. And I would like to, to ask the, you know, a reflection from the rest of the panel, from Nuria Claire and from uh, Taria, uh, regarding your, your vision about uh, the energy systems and whether you think that the islands can be inspiration of such kind of transformation of the energy systems with uh, more uh, small-scale uh, production units and uh, whether this is uh, just an illusion uh, and we, cannot, we can never actually cover our energy needs or uh, if this is something that can be applicable at a certain extent. Let's start with uh, Nuria. Yes, um, actually, I, I like what you were saying, and it goes in the same direction. Uh, the studies that we asked for in, and we got from the, the Secretariat, they, they all go kind of in the same direction. The first one, well, there were two. One was follow-up, the, the other one was about the, the transmission uh, grid, um, um, because right now we don't even comply with uh, uh, N minus one, so we don't comply with the security. We have only one line, so we this has to be solved, and the solution is going with another line, which is almost parallel with the first one, and it goes from the thermal plant to the to the other side of the island, which we think it doesn't make any sense uh, because uh, well, we should think of a more distributor, like the, the new generation will not be in the same place as the, the thermal plant right now. So the study was showing us that the good solution would be to, to have uh, uh, storage as a transmission asset. So if you plan the, the batteries in the right places, batteries or storage uh, in the right places, then, then you probably don't need as much uh, grid or, or it can work in another way. Uh, so that's uh, theoretically it's a good solution. And then the other study we, we asked for is, and this, this is quite specific to, to La Palma, but I think every island can will have different solutions and there is no one only solution for, for everything, but our island is very high. Uh, we have uh, the peak is 2,400 meters, and with all the wind, that means that the one side of the island gets a lot of rain and not the other side. Uh, and, and we have the whole island it's filled with uh, water reservoirs, uh, big and small pipes going up and down that now we are not using 
the energy, the potential energy of these pipes going down, and we are pumping uh, water to the other side of the island, which is, uh, it's, we don't know exactly, but it's between 5 and 10% of the electricity use. Uh, we could use that. And, and the study was asking, uh, well, could you use the, the actual sum of the water reservoirs that we have for a pumping storage? And the answer is yes. Um, the numbers, because it was a feasibility study, and the numbers show, I think it was 180 uh, euros uh, megawatt hour, uh, the cost that it, it's, it can start working, which is less than the more than 200 that costs right now uh, um, using the, 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 the thermal plant. But still, it's not very low. Uh, that just having into account the um, uh, energy and capacity markets. But here it's what I think it's key. So it happens what you were asking. Uh, we need other markets. We need local markets and we need uh, flexibility markets. Uh, right now we don't even have uh, local markets. So it's totally nonsense what is happening because our um, price signal in, in La Palma is the same as mainland, which uh, sometimes now it's, it's zero in the middle of the day because they have a lot of uh, photovoltaic and wind, uh, but we are burning diesel in our island in that moment, which is it totally doesn't make any sense. So we really need uh, real um, prices that in local markets. And, and that's if this doesn't happen, I, I don't see how the rest can actually happen. Okay, uh, Taria? Hi, so yeah, in Estonia, we just, counted that this morning that we have 23 islands that uh, the people are living all year round and most of them are not of course connected to the main grid so being independent and used of solar and wind is the is the main thing and also some part of fossil fuels of course so it's uh, but i think it's the the new the, the wind energy will give us the new opportunity to do to, to, uh, new grids, new solutions, be smart. Like uh, it's, it's boosting because it brings uh, money to the area so you can be wise and, uh, and develop like for, from your own needs. You don't have to like depend what is, what is available for you like in previously. But to being independent by energy wise is something that is so so while and uh, like <laughs> thinking way of thinking so in estonia yeah there is a lot of islands and they are all independent and uh, now they are like our source for for electricity for the for the mainland yeah i don't think there is how to say it's the common thing for us that it's even like funny to think about it that they are independent every every second of the year yeah, and then through the independence can provide also inspiration through the solutions uh, developed in the smaller islands. Uh, I think I recall also the, one of the islands, Wormsey, it's in the... Yeah. Uh, I recall have. a strategy there about the smart Wormsey some years ago. I don't know what uh, happened there, but I guess there is plenty of room with the smaller islands even. Yeah, if you bring like people, tourists to the small island and they want to put their mobile phone charges in and you say to them it's not possible, but because it's not, there is no electricity, the people from the mainland or outside, don't, they don't understand that. If there is no solar, there is no electricity, then just put the, put the input is there, like, I put it there. So it's uh, the way of thinking, but I think the local people are really good at it. Okay, Claire, what are the regions saying about the, the, the energy transition? Uh, are there four smaller systems and locally based or even larger systems uh, like uh, big offshore wind parks? Well, I mean, I think that would depend on the regions and also on the policies that are implemented. But um, what I hear that keeps coming back is that um, we need planning, we need uh, like a strategy and, and, uh, and organize uh, uh, strategy, yes. And um, that makes me think that I think it's important that regions uh, have a say in that planning uh, because when they are um, effectively thinking about those uh, strategies with the state, they are also the one who knows their own territory and their, their own challenges and their own stakeholders. So 
I'm just thinking of that uh, also to, to put to the conversation because um, I was also in the session on wind and we also talk about marine spatial planning. So I think beyond the technical challenges, there is also this question of uh, multi-level uh, governance that is really important when it comes to this, uh, this energy transition. Indeed. Um, so I think we have uh, around 10 to 15 minutes and I would like to uh, give the floor to the, to the audience for your questions. We have the time for three to five questions. So if you want to, to raise your hands and maybe we have some microphones around if needed. Um, uh, questions uh, regarding what you, you heard from the panel or if you want more clarifications about uh, uh, grid uh, uh, issues and uh, storage technologies or uh, how we can actually envisage, let's say, the digitalization of the grids. Any questions? It's a big room. Thank you. Colleague from Saremo. Uh, the question about the flexibility market, uh, because the panel is about the grid storage and uh, system operations. It sounds like very hardware. Uh, but what about the smartness, the, the flexibility market? Because this is the, really the alternative to enhance the grids. Um, would you like uh, some, uh, Costa? You would like to provide uh, a question on that. Would you see flexibility mechanisms to be enabled in the in the islands, and uh, in which uh, in which cases would that be feasible? I think what we have been discussing is flexibility. Uh, flexibility is uh, dispersed generation, is demand response, and uh, storage. This is the, the three pillars of uh, flexibility. So. Um, uh, these are, are, are uh, components which are taken already in, in the discussion. Uh, perhaps you are uh, referring to the smartness, let's say, uh, of uh, the interoperability of these components. I think that's actually, uh, you're right, it's, it's an open discussion, and I think it's uh, a very vivid discussion on the European context between the TSOs and the DSOs, because uh, the, the boundaries between these two are not uh, clear. Uh, and the rules of uh, the DSOs talking to the TSOs are not uh, fixed at the moment. So yes, I agree that there is a, a shortage of um, uh, smart solutions in this uh, uh, integration of the three pillars of, uh, of uh, uh, flexibility. I, I think that's the, the, the obligation of uh, the TSOs and the DSOs to find the right solutions. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you, if you want to, to, to follow up on the question, but uh, for me, it, it remains, okay, I mean, distributed uh, production from renewable cities in place, but uh, I don't think we see so much uh, uh, demand response or storage uh, systems being installed or a market active, especially in low voltage or in, in smaller islands or in non connected islands, and that will be a part of our uh, work as Secretary in collaboration with the DSO, so we will have some more insights in the, in the next month. Uh, but uh, do you see that uh, this is a, a market that could be activated in the, in the near future? Definitely, and I think uh, what you mentioned that uh, there's not enough demand response in place is due to the fact that there is no uh, market. So because the, there's no, because from, from the generators or the DSO's uh, uh, point of view, you can act. But uh, from the demand uh, response, you need the consumers to act. And you need to incentivize the consumers to act. Otherwise, why would they do it? Uh, so um, yeah, I, I think it, it's missing. And uh, I'm sure there are, um, there's enough uh, carrots uh, to, to, to give to the consumers to, to act. You don't need a stitch for this. And uh, in the case of I mean, uh, having a regulated price in the, in the islands, regardless of the actual cost, do you think that still there can be a demand response in that case? I mean, as uh, Nuria uh, presented, that uh, you know there can be at the same price with uh, mainland Spain. So, what? Uh, how much demand response can be there available? Uh, that's a very hot uh, political issue as to uh, whether the tariffs uh, should be the same as in the mainland or not, or whether it should be uh, flat or uh, 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 it should follow some uh, pattern. Uh, I don't think anyone uh, would like to touch this, 
Um, so I, I'm, uh, and as Euroelectric, we are more favorable of uh, incentives than of uh, penalties. So yeah, I think you can incentivize uh, people to, to act on demand response, and I think it will be more efficient. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience on the first line? Roman. Hi, Roman from Free. I'm also part of a secretariat team. And when researching the islands, as we do with Elise, we hear from many island operators that there's a cap on how much clean electricity can be integrated in the grid. But it varies from island to island. Sometimes it's 10% solar, sometimes it's 20 or 30% variable renewable energy as a whole. And I'd like to ask the panel how much of that is factual, technical truth, and how much of that is resistance to chain as can happen from an operator. Thank you. No, I think that's a, a valid question. And I think I've been addressing this uh, question from well, the years that I've been studying in the Technical University was oh, well, there is a rule of thumb about 30%. <laughs> uh, but yeah, based on experience and on studies at that point. But um, uh, I don't know if uh, the panel has uh, experience on that. And uh, um, uh, definitely, I know that the uh, costos can, can reflect on that. But I don't know if uh, any other of you, uh, Taria, if you, if you know in Estonia and especially in uh, congestion uh, conditions, uh, reaching a point of uh, cap for the integration of uh, intermittent renewables? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, what was my idea? Uh, yeah, uh, you cannot uh, put any uh, new solar uh, electricity in, in the grid in Estonia altogether, but definitely not in the, on the islands, because the grid is full and it's like, like ex extra full, but there is standing my friend uh, Merit, who is local, and uh, she is the head of a local co lo college, and she lives at the forest, like deep in the forest, and this winter, what, what was kind of hard winter, she was out of electricity more than 10 days in a row, so it's, uh, the local grid is not excellent, to be, to be, to be honest, so I think that is the the issue that uh, if there is useful electricity and there is enough electricity, there is point to develop the grid. Uh, but it's kind of like egg, a chicken, and who have to be the first one, the producing of electricity or the use of electricity. But I think it's more or less the political view that if, it, if we uh, decide that uh, islands are important and people on the islands are important and the new production uh, facilities are important to islands, then we have to go and uh, and uh, build up the new grid. That is basically, and of course we can like uh, choose the time when we put our uh, like <laughs> mashi washing machine on or, or what, but but it's kind of higher political level. And and for Estonia, I have to say that uh, the islands are always been like the sad side of uh, electricity grid because they are, are like far away from the main grid. But I, like, like I started the, my, my, my part and it's changing and the offshore wind is the one who's changing everything. And, and kind of uh, we are in the same pool now. And I hope the next year Merit uh, has electricity all year round. That's good news. Um, well, uh, if, I, if I reflect uh, to, to, to uh, Roman's question, and I would like to, to give the other word to Kostas, because uh, it's an it's a, it's a area that uh, I, I'm sure that you have uh, something to, to add to that. But, um, you know, we have many cases also in the, you know, we have even calls on the horizon about the geographical islands and energy islands. So we have conditions of uh, congestion in the, in the system, even in the connected uh, or mainland grids or even in uh, islands that they are interconnected, like it's very typical with Orkney Islands that they have uh, congestion, they cannot actually uh, absorb and use the energy produced on the, on the island. So in many cases, we end up of having different uh, caps. Uh, from, from my experience, and uh, well, unfortunately, uh, I, I think that it is uh, very close to the truth, is that every, in every case, a system has to be analyzed on the specific conditions to uh, conclude on the percentage. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, from my experience, again, I know that um, it can end up very much on the on, on the operator and whether you have more automized way of controlling the system and maximizing, let's say, the penetration, or if it is left upon the user or the human factor of actually setting a cap on the penetration of renewables. This was definitely in the past, and uh, you know, we we know also in bundled conditions uh, in in Greek islands with PPC that there was a system operator that depending of how brave the person was or how much you know counting or the forecasting of wind for the next hours could go higher in penetrating or allowing uh, wind in the system or not. But I think now also with upgrading the systems we have more automation and more. Uh, forecasting that can support this kind of operation. And of course, I, I know that you have experience also in uh, in managing thermal power plants back in, in Greece, so you have been in the whole uh, frame of that. Uh, the issue of how much uh, renewables uh, can fit into the system, of course, uh, uh, the answer is simple. There is no single answer. Uh, and uh, there is uh, two components. One is how much uh, the grids can support and the other one uh, in terms of capacity, and the other one is uh, how much uh, uh, you are losing on the stability side, which is what I mentioned before by introducing. These are two different things. Uh, with regard to the capacity, I think it's quite straightforward. The more uh, uh, the larger grids you have, the more renewables you, you can inject. Uh, but for stability, which is actually the factor that uh, defines the percentage that you mentioned, uh, this can uh, vary uh, hugely. Um, there is a, a rule of thumb of 20-30% renewables, but we know many examples that it can go much higher or, or less. And this has to do with actually what kind of renewables are you installing, because all, not all renewables are, are made the same in terms of uh, their stability. So if you have uh, everything is windmills, then the, yeah, you are on the, on the lower limit. Whereas if you have hydro, which is stable, or geothermal, which is also stable, you can go much, much higher. So uh, depending on what renewables, the technologies that you use, and what's available in terms of stability on the grid and the distances, uh, you can have a huge fluctuation of these percentages. So it, it can be, it, it can vary uh, very much. And I agree with Costas that actually um, um, automation is, is critical because you cannot rely on the, the bravery of, of the people or their heroism. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just, just to add also to, uh, and uh, we'll come to, to Nuria, that in, in also from personal experience in, in Lesbos Island, Island, you can also end up having uh, congestion or low penetration due to the architecture of the grid. That if you have a high penetration of renewables in one part of the island, then in terms of structure of the grid or the availability of the substations can end up of having curtailments of, uh, of the penetration of the, of the renewables there. So it's a matter also of upgrading or introducing even uh, storage in, in specific strategic points of the grid. Uh, Nuria. Yeah, I just wanted to add that from the point of view that we that wanted to install a, a small PV was only 100 kilowatt. Uh, our experience is like they, we couldn't connect it uh, because of uh, there was uh, capacity in the grid and, and everything, but uh, the numbers of the it was the end of the line, and then you know you get some numbers, uh, three numbers that were out of the norm that you know you, you it was a little bit out, and, and then we're like okay, but can can what can we do to actually put it and, and help to stabilize the grid? Because actually, we, we want to, to help, uh, not the, the way around. And there was no way, <laughs> the way to understand. So I think I'm saying this because uh, these numbers come are the same in the whole Spain. And, and maybe we should think about introducing some, some exceptions or some way of looking locally uh, how to, you know, you, the numbers are these ones, but maybe if you do that, uh, you you could install this PV because right now we are 90% uh, thermal generation and that we cannot install uh, a PV installation that we have the money and we have everything. It's it's quite absurd. So I think we have to, to think further from, from these numbers that I don't know where they come from. Okay. Uh, we have a time for a last uh, question from the audience. Um, if you would like to, to address the panel. And the first line. Thomas 
Thomas Astrup, island of Eero, Denmark. Question about mobile batteries. I mean, we're talking about batteries as a means of uh, storage, and we have locally a discussion about mobile batteries. I mean, we're looking into a future where transport will be electrified, electric ferries, electric vehicles. So the idea has come up that maybe we actually don't need to install that many batteries, stationary batteries on the island, because we can just wait for the mobile batteries. I don't personally believe in it. I go to meetings with the TSO, and, and they're discussing it at a um, regulatory level. So I, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts, inputs, I mean, from the islands that you represent, the forums that you um, are uh, involved in, and, and maybe, maybe um, Aero Electric has some uh, viewpoints on this, so I can take it back home and, and maybe others can, can use it. Thank you. Um, yeah, before going to, to Kosas, if you have any uh, reaction from the rest of the panel. Uh, talking about mobile uh, batteries, uh, uh, I mean, do you mean uh, grid scale uh, battery storage uh, as, a, as a battery pack or even uh, electric vehicles with different batteries I mean, of the vehicle with a vehicle to grid and... Okay, so may, mainly through uh, mobility, I mean, electrical vehicles, electrical ferries, and how, as you said, through bidirectional uh, charging or discharging and support, actually, the, the operation of the system. Okay. Uh, well, definitely it's something uh, that we, we, I can tell you from my experience, and especially from the Astipalia project, you know, with uh, the involvement of, of Volkswagen, um, there was a, a big discussion of uh, having all the different incentives of having the electrification of the of the vehicles, uh, whether we could rely on that for the you know, for for the use of as mobile batteries. Um, however, we have ended up of having an auction now and uh, in place, and also um, awarded for a hybrid that there will be a battery pack with the PV station and uh, providing the, the storage, although in the same time there is uh, incentives for introducing more electrical vehicles. So I think that you know, having the, the security element in that, it is a hard decision to say, okay, I will rely on the near future or at some future to have a sufficient uh, storage uh, from electric vehicles and through the incentives for vehicle to grid that can uh, provide the storage you need. So that, that is a, a practical, let's say, uh, case that uh, we uh, proposed it as a nice, let's say, idea, but uh, in practical terms it was uh, rejected. But uh, yeah, of course, if you have some views on that. I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, Euroelectric having a position on this. I don't think so. Actually, that's a very good issue that we can take up in Euroelectric because we are, uh, we are preparing uh, uh, a paper on uh, this. Um, uh, my opinion is that uh, you cannot uh, rely uh, on uh, vehicles to grid, uh, V2G uh, storage, uh, in terms of uh, the security of, of supply. Um, because uh, the V2G is to a great extent, uh, it's, it's a private uh, uh, operation. Uh, so uh, uh, con prosumers, consumers can decide to, uh, to act on this or not. Uh, but you cannot rely a whole system on on, on the private uh, decision. But uh, so I, I believe that uh, the, the the stability tools uh, need to be uh, uh, irrespective of uh, the uh, the bidirectionality, the V2G. However, uh, having said that, I think this can be taken uh, to into consideration when deciding the redundancy that the system uh, need. Uh, we know the n minus one or the n minus two in some cases rule. So do you have to, uh, you need to have more capacity uh, either if it's a generation or, or storage installed. Uh, so in, in in a system where you know by fact that uh, V2G is uh, is uh, widely uh, spread, then you can decide to have more relaxed um, rules and not apply, for example, the n minus two and apply n minus one or go from n minus one to n. Uh, so I think, yes, it, it can be taken, but up to, uh, to a certain uh, level.
Okay, thank you, Gostas. I, I think we have uh, reached the the, uh, the the end, more or less, of this uh, session. I think that, that from the from the discussion, the, from the question raised, and the um, uh, the points from the panelists, we we understand that uh, really the, the islands uh, can, and we expect that they will be will be. Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 yeah, for certain, a laboratory of uh, new technologies related with uh, uh, grid, with storage, with uh, uh, flexibility, they are much much needed in terms of production uh, technologies. Uh, as you heard also in the morning, and from the, from Alexis, from Sasso, from other islands, the technologies are there, and we need all the uh, the rest of the uh, material to to really glue the technologies together. Um, so, uh, well, I think that the Secretary has a lot of work to do in the next years and we will go towards this direction. Thank you for this uh, session and, uh, yeah, we follow with the rest. Thank you very much.